on October 7th, 2023. Hamas militants, along with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, invading the country and attacking and killing more than 1,400 Israelis, taking more than 240 civilian hostages, including children and babies. There was mass rape and torture, and it's now considered the greatest tragedy in Israel's history, as well as the most heinous crime that's ever been committed by a terrorist group. Now, Israel responded with widespread bombing of the Gaza Strip and a full ground invasion, which killed and injured tens of thousands of Palestinians in the area. Israel was blatantly attacked. They clearly have a right to exist and a right to fight back, but they're dealing with a terrorist group that knows that dead civilians and destroyed cities and mass carnage only make Israel look bad. And these are people that are willing to use their own citizens as human shields, who are willing to hide amongst those who have been taught for generation that Israel is the enemy and dying. Fighting Israel is a good cause that will take you to heaven. So the problem to me, it seemed obvious at first, was it's Hamas, right? They don't care what's best for their people. They make deals with their own people and renege. We hear about a ceasefire all the time, but there was a ceasefire with Israel on October 6th that Hamas broke. What is Israel supposed to do? That's kind of where my brain was at first. Does that seem reasonable? Well, of course it does. And 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 I think, you know, uh, the, every Israeli that I know refers to October 7th as the worst day in the country's history. Uh, it was a trauma uh, the videos that exist of it are horrifying. The acts committed by the Hamas terrorists are despicable. Um, and so the first reaction is, you know, we've, we've, we've got to seek vengeance against Hamas for what they did, right? But it gets more complicated from then on. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today, we're going to have a candid conversation about the crisis in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Now, I've been hesitant to talk about this issue because it's so incredibly complicated. I believe it's one of those topics you can't just weigh in on. The crisis in the Middle East is thousands of years old. There are people who devote their entire lives to studying and working on it and still don't have the answers. But since this show is fundamentally about American politics, and America has been deeply, if indirectly, involved in the crisis since the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, I felt like we couldn't just leave it. But I go into this conversation fully aware of how ignorant I am when it comes to the nuance of this subject. What I am, however, is open-minded, good at research, and pretty well connected to true experts and scholars. So I'm having this conversation today with my friend David Rothkop. David is the CEO of the Rothkop Group, best-selling author and journalist and host of the Deep State Radio podcast. He served as Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce and International Trade Policy in the Clinton administration, working as a professor in international affairs at Columbia University, Georgetown, and John Hopkins, and is a contributing columnist to the Daily Beast and a member of the Board of Contributors of USA Today. David has authored hundreds of articles for multiple publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and Financial Times, and is a regular commentator on pretty much all broadcast media. He is also a Jewish man who believes in the right of Israel to exist, but recently published a piece in the longest-running newspaper in Israel titled, Are There No Red Lines for U.S. Support for Israel? Acknowledging that while October 7th was clearly a heinous crime that needs to be dealt with, there is still the question of how many people in Gaza have to die before the U.S. reconsiders its unconditional support for the war that's being waged by Israel's government. Again, I want to be very clear. I understand I am not in the position to truly weigh in on any of this, further than saying I'm in full support of the right of Israel to exist in peace, the right for Palestinians to exist in peace, my absolute opposition to terrorism of any kind, like what we saw Hamas inflict on the Israeli people on October 7th, and I'm against any sort of war crimes that we appear to be watching in some form under the leadership of Benjamin Netanyahu. I am adamantly against anti-Semitism in all of its forms, just as I am against Islamophobia in all of its forms. But I should also be clear that I am not the biggest fan of organized religion in general, particularly when it causes people to see others as less than and uses it as a device for hate. I feel that sentiment here in America, just as I feel that when it comes to China and the Uyghurs and the conflicts in the Middle East. As I said, this is a deeply complicated issue but not killing, raping, kidnapping, and bombing your neighbors also seems pretty obviously wrong. The question is, 
what do we as American allies do when it comes to this conflict? And I thought we should sit down and talk about it. So without further ado, please welcome best-selling author, international expert, and deep and brilliant thinker, David Rothkop. Welcome back, David. Glad to be back. Well, thanks for joining me today. You and I were supposed to talk about Christofascism in America and how you see it as one of the most dangerous threats to the country right now. But since October 7th, this crisis in the Middle East has really become not only a major crisis in that region, but a major crisis in America as well. And I read your most recent article in Haratz, and I thought it was probably more of value to the audience for us to have this conversation right now instead. And we can come back to another crisis based on another religion a bit later. Seem fair? Crisis for everybody. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Everyone gets a crisis. It's like Oprah for religious crises. Okay, so as I was saying in my introduction, I felt incredibly hesitant to talk about this. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Muslim. Despite the fact that I love people of both faiths, I'm not an expert or a scholar in the Middle East. I have followed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since I was in college, and President Clinton, who you worked for, tried to make a deal with what seemed very reasonable, two-state solution with Yasser Arafat of the PLO, but he turned it down. But this is one of those world issues that no matter how much I know, it feels irresponsible for me to act like I am anything other than ignorant on the subject. And yet, we find ourselves in a place where we can't close our eyes to what's going on or act like it doesn't affect us because it does. And we should at the very least have a general understanding and sense of what's going on over there and where we stand on such an important issue. No question that that's true. I don't think one needs to be an expert. I think one needs to be a human being. I think one needs to feel compassion uh, for anybody who is innocent and not, you know, participating in a conflict voluntarily, who uh, is 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 suffering as a consequence of it, or who has family members who are suffering as a consequence of it. And I think one can also have perspectives perhaps that are are, are commonsensical, where uh, we prefer peace to war, we prefer stability to instability, we prefer as Americans to have our interests look out for, uh, in other words, to have a, a safer, more prosperous planet. And I think those are the things that uh, searching for them will lead to the right kind of conclusions about what's going on right now in Israel and Gaza. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So here's what I know as far as giving people some background on the topic for us to move forward. Israel is the world's only Jewish state. It's located east of the Mediterranean Sea. Palestinians, the Arab population that comes from the land Israel now controls, refer to the territory as Palestine. And they want to establish a state by that name, on all or part of that same plot of land. So the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is over who gets what land and how it's controlled. Does that seem fair? Uh, It seems fair. You know, as, as you noted, this is a very complicated situation. It has existed... You know this 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 piece of land has been contested by different uh, empires and peoples for thousands of years, and it has been claimed and governed by different groups of people over that time, Syrians and and uh, Romans and Greeks and others, and so uh, you know I, we have to be careful when we're describing the history, not to describe the history that is preferred by one side or the other. Uh, And both sides, you know, make a case. You know, Jews say, the Jews have been here for thousands of years. This was originally the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And they sort of overlook the fact that in the intervening past thousand years, other people have controlled it. The Palestinians say, you know, this is our land. We have occupied it for hundreds of years, but there has never been a, a state called Palestine. The region was called Palestine under the British Empire. Both sides have legitimate claims to the land. But, you know, we as Americans, I think we have to be fair uh, to acknowledge this, or anybody anywhere on the planet should realize that it's a slippery slope when you start saying, well, the land belongs to somebody who controlled it several hundred years ago or several thousand years ago, because we would then be living in, I'd be living in the Powhatan nation here in, 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 you know, in Washington. 
Um, indigenous people controlled this part of the world for a long time, thousands, tens of thousands of years before Europeans arrived here. And that's true of every country. And, and so history is made up in part of those kind of legacy issues and in part the consequence of politics and conflict and people seizing land that they feel that they had a claim to or a right to or simply desired to hold. Now, with that in mind, do you think you have the tolerance to bear with me for a little bit if I then go back and give a little more background? Because I think it's surprising how little we know about these things that we think we know a lot about. And I want people to leave the show feeling like they learned something. So I would love to back it up and give some broad strokes on how we got where we are today before we talk about the most immediate crisis. Would you mind if I did that? Not at all. Do you want to go 3,000 years back, 4,000? I am not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But right. but please cut in if I get anything wrong as I attempt to summarize, as you're saying, 3,000 years of religious and political conflict. So here's what I'll say. Both the Jewish population and the Arab Muslim population date their claim to this particular part of the world to at least, as you're saying, a couple thousand years ago. The current political conflict that we're seeing today, however, began in the early 20th century. So modern Israel has its origins in what's called the Zionism movement. The Zionism movement was established in the late 19th century by Jewish people in the Russian Empire who were asking for the establishment of a Jewish state after the horrible pogroms they had to endure. And pogroms were essentially the organized massacre of particular ethnic groups, but particularly the Jewish people in the Russian and Eastern European uh, areas in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So in in 1896, a Jewish Austrian journalist named Theodor Herzl published a very influential political paper called The Jewish State, in which he argued that the establishment of a Jewish state was the only way to really protect Jews from anti-Semitism. And the journalist went on to become the leader of Zionism, and he created the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland in 1897. At the time, the Ottoman Empire controlled the piece of land in the Middle East that was called Palestine. And it was the part of the world that was considered the original home of the Jewish people. As you say, lots of people have claim to it. So it was this part of the Ottoman Empire that the Zionism movement chose to be the most desirable location for a potential Jewish state. And Herzl petitioned the Ottoman government for a charter to create a Jewish state, but the Ottoman Empire turned him down. Then after the failed Russian Revolution of 1905, bigger and bigger numbers of Eastern European and Russian Jews started to immigrate to that area in the Middle East anyway, joining thousands of other Jewish settlers who had already arrived. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed during World War I, it was Great Britain, as you said, that took over that piece of land. And in 1917, Britain issued what was called the Belfort Declaration, which declared their intent to establish a Jewish homeland in that area. And I think it's best for people to remember that this was a time of empires, right? This country controls that country. This country was part of that commonwealth. There was just a lot of world reorganization and changing of country control, more so than we have right now. And countries were created and countries collapsed and borders changes and country names and leaders were flip-flopped. It was a very busy time in world history. But I can imagine if you were someone living in an area called Palestine, whether it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire or the British, you might be like, what do you mean this land is now going to be a Jewish state? Like, no thanks. I already live here. And all the neighboring Arab nations who had historically driven the Jewish people out of the area in the first place were clearly not that thrilled to have them coming back. So when the British issued the Belfort Declaration, a lot of the Arab states in the neighborhood protested. But the declaration was included in the British mandate over Palestine. And since it was technically, quote unquote, their land to control, they could choose what they wanted to do with it. And then the entire idea was authorized by the League of Nations in 1922. Am I on the right track so far? So far, you're on the you're on. It's very complicated and you're making it simple. So you're on the right track. Oh, thank you. Okay. So because the Arab population so vehemently opposed the idea of the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, the British continued to rule that area through the 1930s because they knew they couldn't just leave it without the whole thing falling apart. 
They did, however, attempt to limit Jewish immigration to the area as a way to make concessions to the Arab population and because the Arab and Jewish populations had started to openly fight. But then we had World War II. And Jewish people from all over the world just started coming to Palestine. They were technically entering illegally, but considering what was going on in the world, they really felt like they had nowhere else to go. And then we came to the end of World War II, and the United States took up the Zionist cause. Great Britain, who was kind of unable to find another solution, basically passed the entire issue over to the United Nations. And in 1947, the United Nations voted to partition what was called Palestine, so that the Jewish population could have some of the land and the Arab population could have some of the land. And that plan made everyone unhappy, right? It basically failed with Israel and the surrounding nations then having just a bunch of land wars over the territory for the next couple of decades. I mean, the day after the British withdrew from the area in 1948, the day after the state of Israel was declared, Israel was invaded by forces from Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and what was then called Transjordan. And they'd been a country for a whole day and then they were attacked. So today, Israel's border lines largely reflect the outcomes of the two biggest wars fought over the territory, one in 1948 and one in 1967. Israel, as I said, was attacked in 1948 and ended up with a bunch more land after those wars. Then they were attacked in 1967 and they increased their borders again. 1967, which is called the Six Day War, is particularly important for today's conflict because it gave Israel control over what's called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which are two territories that were home to really large Palestinian populations. Today, The West Bank is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, but it's under Israeli occupation, which means that Israeli troops enforce security restrictions on Palestinian movement and activities, which I'm sure anyone can imagine the Palestinians do not like. And the West Bank also has a lot of Israeli settlers, which means Jewish people building communities there and effectively denying Palestinians their own space. Is that a fair assessment? That that territory was seen as Palestinian territory. And there has been a systematic effort by Israelis, right-wing Israelis particularly, to clip away at it, you know, to, to carve away by putting in these settlements, by pushing out the Palestinians, and by gaining more and more of the land as uh, not just controlled at, at the borders by the Israelis, but controlled within the borders by the Israelis. So you've even eroded the 1967 borders that you referred to uh, and ex- in like that they territory. They sort of encroached out even further. Okay. Within it. It's, you know, it's sort of cut it, cut it up from within. Okay. But Gaza, which is a separate area, is controlled by Hamas, which is an Islamic military group, right? Theoretically, they were elected by the people of Gaza in 2006. But they only got 44% of the vote, and the more moderate Fatah party, is it Fatah? Yeah, the Palestinian Authority, essentially. Yeah, Uh, they got 41% of the vote. So that election that people are like, well, they elected these people. You're like, well, 44% of them elected Hamas, and 41% voted for the sort of moderate party that really was supporting negotiations for a two-state solution and recognized Israel's right to exist. So there was two completely dichotomous ideas in the Gaza uh, government as to which way it should go. I wouldn't say they were completely dichotomous. In other words, okay. you know, Yasser Arafat, who was a terrorist, controlled the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which became the Palestinian Authority. So their roots were in fighting for their land. Hamas, which, you know, emerged from a, 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 a slightly even more aggressive faction, was supported uh, by uh, Iran and, and some foreign actors, was, a, was even more extreme. And that was the choice. I think the other thing to keep in mind here, though, was since Benjamin Netanyahu became prime minister uh, and who's effectively been the, the, the principal leader of Israel for the past 20 or so years, got into power, he concluded that having two different political groups among the Palestinians, rather than having them all united under the Palestinian Authority, was actually in the interests of Israel, because he thought it weakened them. 
He thought neither one of them could actually lead, and he has always been uh, against this two-state solution. He he opposed the people who negotiated that you referred to with the, the Clinton administration, like uh, the, the slain Israeli leader Yitzhak Rabin. And he actually, Netanyahu actually directed funds, uh, encouraged the Qataris and others to direct funds into Hamas to strengthen Hamas because he thought that would weaken the Palestinian Authority, which was in his overall interest, because ultimately what he wants is a Jewish state, and he wants the Palestinian influences out. Okay, so if Hamas wants the river to the sea for the Palestinian people, or at least for them, then Benjamin Netanyahu wants the river to the sea for the Jewish population. Would that yeah, be Yeah, and I don't assessment? think he would use that language. You know, <laughs> no, I mean, he wouldn't. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's... But you know, the whole area, they are both more interested in a one-state solution where they come out on top. I think they are. The problem with a one-state solution is Israel, you know, we supported Israel for a long time because it was the Middle East's only democracy. We would refer to it that way. Well, there are roughly as many Palestinians as there are Israelis, and with demographic trends, there could be more Palestinians than there are Israelis. If the state were truly democratic, then it wouldn't be an Israeli or a Jewish state anymore. It would be a majority-ruled state, uh, and it would lose that identity. And so the Israelis, some of whom will characterize it this way, say they face a choice. You can either be Jewish and something less than democratic, or you can be democratic and you, and not Jewish. And what Netanyahu and company have chosen is to be Jewish, but less than democratic, and to right. carve away at the rights of Palestinians, to you know, set aside the the rights of those that live within those territories as being different from the ones within Israel, of changing the citizenship laws within Israel, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to the point that his critics assert that it is a kind of an apartheid state where there are two sets of rules, um, and people can debate that. Personally, I believe that that's a fair characterization, um, but. People can debate it, but what you what you can't debate is that they have sought to damp down the dem- democratic rights and privileges of the Palestinians so that they could maintain the the identity of Israel that they see as paramount, which is a Jewish state for the Jewish people. Right. Which is sort of similar and has similar sensibility to what we're talking about here and what we were originally going to talk about, which is like there are people in America who believe we can have a white Christian state, uh, which is less than democratic, or we can have a pluralistic multicultural democracy, which is a democracy, and they're more interested in a state that is a white Christian nation. Yeah, no, no. But there, you know, within that group, there's a group called Dominionists who believe Mm -hmm. that they should a- actively seek Christian leadership for the United States. And in fact, the Speaker of the House, who uh, Mike Johnson, who falls into that group, I read yesterday, has three flags out in front of his office, the flag of the United States, the flag of the state of Louisiana, and a Christian dominionist kind of flag, which you know is associated with this group. Now, interestingly, and I don't mean to complicate your story here, but it's important because <laughs> it's complicated. It, but it, but but interestingly, whereas a lot of the support for Israel initially came from Jewish Americans, who like the Israelis were heavily affected by the Holocaust and really felt that this haven was needed. In recent years, increasing amounts of the support for the United States' closeness with Israel have come from evangelical Americans because they believe in an end times prophecy, uh, which involves something called the rapture, which can't happen unless Jews control the Holy Land. And so they want to make sure that that happens so that they get the end times that they think to which they are entitled. Now, I always point out that those end times don't turn out very well for the Jews. You know, they, 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 all the evangelicals fly up to heaven, and the Jews are left around going, why are these cars coming at me with no drivers in them? Because 
you know, they've all gone off to heaven, you know, and it, and and it's it's like I support you, but not for the reasons you want me to support you. Um, yeah. And of course, because that group, the evangelicals, is the base of the modern Republican Party. It's the core of the MAGA movement. It has allied itself with the more extreme right-wing Israelis like Netanyahu, but also like some uh, right-wing American Jews who were in the Trump administration. And you got this coalition that made Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, stop being nonpartisan when dealing with the U.S. and start pandering to the Republican Party, which he saw as more supportive of his agenda than uh, the Democrats had been, because the Democrats have always been a little bit more sensitive to issues like, I don't know, the human rights of the Palestinians, and which is not, you know, in Netanyahu's interest. And so this 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 shift among American politics towards this Christian nationalism dovetails with the shift among uh, Israeli politicians towards a kind of Jewish nationalism. And I would add, it's part of a global trend towards what you would call ethno-nationalism that has as part of it Vladimir Putin in Russia, Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, Narendra Modi in, in India. It has had people like Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, and so forth. And, and, and so there is a kind of global, anti-globalist, pro-nationalist, you know, pro-old-school identity movement that wants to get rid of immigration, that wants to, you know, get rid of people that they see as other in their societies, and is willing to use any means necessary, including force, including autocratic means, to achieve those goals. And so these stories are linked in important ways. No doubt. So this current crisis started after Hamas launched what I can only call a disgusting and horrific rampage on Israel on October 7th, 2023. Hamas militants, along with the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, invading the country and attacking and killing more than 1,400 Israelis, taking more than 240 civilian hostages, including children and babies. There was mass rape and torture, and it's now considered the greatest tragedy in Israel's history, as well as the most heinous crime that's ever been committed by a terrorist group. Now, Israel responded with widespread bombing of the Gaza Strip and a full ground invasion, which killed and injured tens of thousands of Palestinians in the area. Israel was blatantly attacked. They clearly have a right to exist and a right to fight back, but they're dealing with a terrorist group that knows that dead civilians and destroyed cities and mass carnage only make Israel look bad. And these are people that are willing to use their own citizens as human shields, who are willing to hide amongst those who have been taught for generations that Israel is the enemy and dying, fighting Israel is a good cause that will take you to heaven. So the problem to me, it seemed obvious at first, was it's Hamas, right? They don't care what's best for their people. They make deals with their own people and renege. We hear about a ceasefire all the time, but there was a ceasefire with Israel on October 6th that Hamas broke. What is Israel supposed to do? That's kind of where my brain was at first. Does that seem reasonable? Well, of course it does. And 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 I think, you know, uh, the, every Israeli that I know refers to October 7th as the worst day in the country's history. Uh, it was a trauma uh, the videos that exist of it are horrifying. The acts committed by the Hamas terrorists are despicable. Um, and so the first reaction is, you know, we've, we've, we've got to seek vengeance against Hamas for what they did, right? But it gets more complicated from then on. Um, yeah. uh, b- b- one issue, which I'll leave to the side for a moment, is how did this happen? You know, did the role the role that the Israeli government play in propping up Hamas produce this problem? Did the focus of the Israeli government on expanding its ground in the West Bank thus leave the southern part of Israel exposed 
did the political ambitions of Netanyahu to roll back democracy, to put in place his, quote, judicial reforms, distract the administration from warnings that they actually got that this kind of thing was possible? The answer to those things is yes. There was a security failure within Israel. And that's going to have to be dealt with at some point. But when you look at the other side of it, you have to ask, what is your goal? Is it retribution against Hamas? Is it neutralization of Hamas? Is it eradication of Hamas? And what then of Gaza and what then of the Palestinian population more broadly? Those are all separate questions. The Israelis said, well, we're going to, our goal is the eradication of Hamas. Well, that's impossible. You're not going to kill everybody who's in Hamas. Um, And when you set goals like that, that leads to endless war, and it also leads to greater and greater carnage. As you said, Hamas likes to use human shields, place itself among human populations. Frankly, they could hardly do otherwise. Gaza is a very small area, right? But uh, there is a tactical choice. I mean, we as Americans know, because we fought against terrorists in Iraq, for example, or in Syria, to some extent in in Afghanistan as well, that when you are leading a counterinsurgency, if you kill civilians, it helps the the terrorists recruit. And there was an American general, Stan McChrystal, who said every one civilian that we would accidentally kill or unintentionally kill, we would create 10 new terrorists. And so when you go in and you, you, you... use military approaches that produce a lot of civilian casualties, you actually reduce the likelihood that you'll succeed if your goal is to eliminate um, Hamas. If your goal is to neutralize Hamas, kill its leaders, eliminate its hiding places, get its money, get rid of its weapons, which is a more reasonable goal, then you might do as the United States ultimately did when uh, it, it, it sort of revised its approach in counterinsurgency, and, and use special forces, very targeted approaches, you know, try very hard, much harder to avoid civilian casualties. Um, that was the approach the U.S. had advised the Israelis to do. And the Israelis had essentially ignored that advice. Right. Now, I think at the end of this month, you'll start to see a change and that okay. the Israelis will shift from the broader war to these more targeted approaches. Um, two things about that. One is, they will have already destroyed Gaza. I mean, yeah. effectively, there are 2.2 2. 2 million people in Gaza. Effectively, all of them have lost their homes at this point. Over 100,000 buildings have been destroyed or damaged. 24,000 people have been killed. 60,000 or so have been injured. Uh, and between now and the end of the month, that number is only going to go up. So, and David, um, can I ask you a question? Can I ask a question there? Because you gave a bunch of stats. There are people that say, "Where are we getting these stats from? These are Hamas stats. They're giving out fake stats." That, that there are statistics. Most of these statistics come from the Gaza Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas. But the United Nations and other independent observers have come to conclude that those numbers are generally true. So take them as a a measure of scale. Don't take them as the exact number. But from a point of view of scale, Gaza is destroyed. That's that's the issue at at, at this point. Now, that raises the next question, right? And the next question is, how do you get from there to peace and stability? Like, who, you know, who's going to, who's going to run this place? Uh, is is Israel going to run this place? If Israel isn't going to run this place, who are they going to let run this place? It can't be Hamas. So, you know, uh, it's going to be the Palestinian Authority. The leader of the Palestinian Authority is old. There, There's a lot of corruption there. Are they going to change their leadership? Who's going to pay for rebuilding it? There's talk, you're going to have the regional states pay for rebuilding it. But the regional states say, oh, no, we've seen this game before. Unless there is a Palestinian authority that is empowered uh, and is actually in the process of moving towards some kind of a two-state solution, we're not going to pay for it. Well, if you don't, you know, you already have one of the, the worst humanitarian crises on the planet now, hunger, 
disease. And, you know, without some kind of administration, that's not going to stop. Now, the Israelis, as recently as yesterday, the defense minister said, well, we'll control the security issues. And the Palestinians or some Palestinians will have charge of the governance of the area. But he was not specific about who. He was not specific about whether, you know, the Israelis are going to pick the Palestinians or the Palestinians are going to pick the Palestinians or the international community is going to play a role. And if so, what that role would play. Um, And so, you know, the problem with the response of the Israelis at the outset is that it was intuitive and short term in its thinking. And there was not longer term thinking about what are our strategic objectives What's the best way to achieve our strategic objectives? And what is our long-term plan to get us to peace? Because that, of course, is, is, is really the ultimate desire of everybody. One last interesting thing here, and then you, know, you, you may have a question or two about it because you touched upon it. And that is that on October 6th, if you had got a group of 100 people in a room and said, what do you think of the two-state solution? They would have said, nah, no, it's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen um, because the Israelis don't want it and you don't have unity in the Palestinians. And maybe you should have a three-state solution, You know, Gaza, West Bank. Maybe Israel should have a one-state solution, but it's more Democrat. Now people realize there is no alternative. The two-state solution is next to impossible, profoundly difficult to achieve. But, you know, as, you know, Churchill said, you know, democracy is the worst of all forms of government, except for all the others, right? The the two-state solution is the worst of all the solutions, except for all the others. You, if you, if you, you want Palestinians to have self-determination, you want them to have security, you want them to have control of their own lives, they need a state. The Israelis want the same thing. Well, how do you get there from here? One thing you know, you got to get rid of Hamas. But the other thing you got to get rid of is Netanyahu and his coalition of right wing Israeli nationalists who have very, very extreme views, who are talking right now about sending all the people from Gaza to like Africa, you know, to just get rid of them. They're literally talking about ethnic cleansing. And so yeah. you got to get rid of that government too. And then you've got to get a reformed Palestinian authority. And then the international community with some new Israeli government, and we're not sure that one's going to be, you know, much more flexible. You've somehow got to get all that on a train to working towards this elusive and difficult uh, but necessary solution. And this is why I said it's a deeply, deeply complicated issue. I mean, if we come back to where we fit into this, where America fits into this, you suggest in the article you wrote that while October 7th was clearly a heinous crime and as responsible members of the world, we should expect fallout from that, we also need to question how much fallout, how far is too far, you know, how... Are we okay if we hear certain Israeli ministers, far-right ministers, promoting what sounds like, as you're saying, ethnic cleansing? How many failures of leadership are we willing to accept from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before we start to reconsider our unconditional support for the war? Not our unconditional support for Israel's right to exist, but our unconditional support to this response. And that makes sense to me. You want to talk to me a little bit about that? Ladies, how about a New Year's resolution that's actually easy to keep? Why not make this year the year we finally stop wearing uncomfortable bras? With that in mind, support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. Honey Love has revolutionized the bra game so you no longer have to deal with uncomfortable underwire without sacrificing support. Now I know that someone like me doesn't need a whole lot of support, but I have tons of friends who do and their bras are miserable. With Honey Love, you'll immediately feel the difference. Their bras are so comfortable you might not want to take them off. Most of us have a go-to bra that we pick over everything else. Honey Love's crossover bra is that bra. Try it out and you might never go back to the other ones. This bra gives all the support of a traditional bra without using underwire, plus mesh detailing that adds just a touch of cool. It's not just supportive and comfortable, it actually looks, dare I say it, sexy. 
None of us like bras that cause back bulge. None of us like our bras digging. But with Honey Love, you won't be getting home from a long day and immediately taking it off. I even know people who sleep in them. And Honey Love has more than just bras. They have incredibly comfortable shapewear, tank tops, and leggings. In fact, Honey Love's Leggings 2.0 is a new product that's really making waves. They hold you in without that tight feeling and are compressive, cooling, and comfortable. Maybe your New Year's resolution is to get more active. I know mine certainly is. Maybe you wanna spend more time at home or you wanna spend more time at the gym. These leggings are perfect for every single one of those things. So treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash politicsgirl. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off. That's honeylove.com slash politicsgirl. And after you've made your purchase, when they ask you how you heard about them, please support the show and tell them that we sent you. Start the new year with confidence. Thanks to Honey Love. Well, winter is here, which means most of us are trying to find the right temperature when we sleep. Did you know that your temperature at night has one of the greatest impacts on your quality of sleep? If you're one of those people who wakes up too hot or too cold, then I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics to make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Miracle Made silver infused sheets are not only thermoregulating, but they also prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Plus, they're just really nice. Deliciously high quality without that horrible high price. See it for yourself. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to try it today. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% off and you use our promo code politicsgirl at checkout. You will also get three free towels and save an extra 20%. That's a real deal. And Miracle is so confident in their product that they've backed it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one. Talk to me a little bit about that because that's sort of what you were questioning. Well, look, the, 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 on October 7th, everybody was horrified. President Biden was horrified. The U.S. government was horrified. Israel was a traditional ally. Israel has a right to defend itself. And the United States' first reaction was, we're with you, we feel your pain, and we will support you in your right to defend yourself. On, on October like 8th, I think, I wrote a column that said, you can't give a blank check to the Israeli government. Because if they go in and essentially do what they've done, it's going to create more problems than it solves. And the United States is going to be tainted by that in the international community, which says all of this killing is associated with the United States, supported by the United States, conducted in parts with U.S. weapons. And by the way, I didn't write that, but you know, there's a political consequence here in the United States for President Biden in an election year where the views on Israel are hugely different from the younger generation to older generations. You know, older generations is sort of saw of Israel as the D- David against Goliath. Younger generations see Israel as Goliath and the Palestinians as David. Older generations saw Israel as kind of the heroic country that made the desert green. Younger generations see it as a regional bully um, and don't see some of those benefits. And there's a big difference in, in U.S. political support. Biden kind of old school, went in, said, okay, we're going to support him, uh, and sent his administration over. But from the beginning, Secretary Blinken, before Biden actually went on his trip there, had a seven-hour meeting with the Israelis in which he said, look, we're not coming unless you let in humanitarian aid. We're not coming unless you do certain things. And finally, the Israelis relented. The United States said, you've got to avoid civilian casualties. You've got to honor the rules of war. And the Israelis paid lip service to it initially, but then increasingly it became clear they didn't pay attention to it. The U.S. said Israel can't control Gaza after the war is over. But Netanyahu said, well, we may control Gaza after the war is over. The U.S. said you can't do ethnic cleansing. Ministers in the Netanyahu government have said as recently as this week that that's their intention. So all of a sudden you've got the U.S., thrown its arms around Israel in this embrace, in part because we thought we could control Israel, increasingly realizing that we've been suckered, that they are taking advantage of it, that they don't care about the consequences for Biden politically. In fact, 
Remember, Netanyahu doesn't particularly go for that, you know, the Democrats in, in, in any case. And he realizes that if Biden pulls back at all, it's going to open up an opportunity here for Republicans to say, oh, Biden is weak on Israel, which would not cut well with their base, right? And so, you know, we've, we've gotten into this situation and it's gotten worse and worse and worse as the death toll has gone up, as the violence has gone up. And one of the consequences of this is that right now, the Biden administration is on its last nerve with Bibi Netanyahu. They, they, they have said, you know, in, in their own closed you know, rooms and in, in other kinds of settings, there is no solution to this war without Bibi Netanyahu and his government going. They've got to be out. Yeah. So yeah. all of a sudden, they're pro-Israel, pro the people of Israel. As far as the government of Israel, not so much. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear. President Biden said in his speech, you know, the Palestinian people are not Hamas, but the Israeli people are not their government either, right? If Trump was president again, God forbid, and say he attacked Mexico as he suggested he might, I would be appalled. He wouldn't speak for me. I wouldn't want that, right? But his actions would be against everything I would stand for. And yet, it would look like America had done this, right? So I think we're in a position where we have to understand that the importance of leadership here, right? It all comes back to the importance of leadership, who you put in charge. Hamas is not going to be making a two-state solution deal. They want Israel gone. And the right-wing Israeli government is not going to be making a reasonable two-state solution because they would rather have it all for themselves anyway to have a, as a, a Jewish state as opposed to a democratic state. Bibi Netanyahu, as far as I'm concerned, and correct me if I'm wrong, is clearly a Trump-type figure, a dictator wannabe. He recently tried to take over his own courts, as you mentioned, and there was such outrage in Israel that he couldn't get it done. There were people just in the streets uh, protesting against him. In fact- for, for 30, 40 weeks before October 7th, the only reason the protest stopped was October 7th. And this, yeah. this week saw the Supreme Court say he couldn't have his way on that. But yeah. like Trump, one of the reasons that he seeks these kind of uh, uh, you know pa extra powers uh, is because he's in the middle of a corruption trial, and uh, you know, and he is worried that he will go to jail, you know, or if if he can't use his power to defend himself, um, yeah. and so that complicates matters a lot. Which is probably why there's talk that Netanyahu has been supporting the leadership of Hamas because it served him staying in power. So there's just a lot of bad players here and a lot of innocent people that are caught in the crossfire. Well, yeah, there, there are a lot of innocent people. I mean, Israeli government, Netanyahu, supported uh, lifting up Hamas a little bit because they thought it, consisted, it was consistent with their strategy. The polls in Israel suggest that if an election were held, Netanyahu would lose. What they do, don't say is who would replace him. And among the choices, there's some center-right choices that would be, you know, Netanyahu light, right? They, they would be be beholden to that right-wing base. And so they would be, it would be hard to get them off of more settlements in the West Bank and hard to get them to brace a two-state solution. There's a possibility that one or two new parties may enter the mix in Israel, including uh, perhaps one that's more center-left. That could produce a somewhat different uh, outcome. But that's by no means a sure thing at this point, which puts the Biden administration in a tough uh, position. And it's one of the reasons, I mean, this administration has the best national security and foreign policy team I have ever seen. And I've written yeah. lots of books about this. I've interviewed almost all of the senior people who've ever held top positions in both Republican and Democratic administrations. This is the A team, Tony Blinken, National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, the D Director of Central Intelligence, Bill Burns, could be the Secretary of State in any other administration, was the Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama administration, uh, Secretary Austin at the Department of Defense. These are first-class people. And what Biden has done is he's put them out there and said, well, let's see if we can find a regional solution. Let's find a way to put this, you know, to, to get our arms around this. And there's a reason for that. The United States and Joe Biden at the beginning of this term 
was trying to pivot away from the Middle East. You know, we we wanted to shift to the Indo-Pacific region, that yeah. we wanted to end the forever wars. Biden got out of Afghanistan, which, you know, it was a mess, but it was the right thing to do. And, and you know, the, the Middle East is not strategically important to us in the way that it was during the Cold War and in the way that it was when we weren't the world's number one producer of, of, of energy. You know, we're, we're the leading producer of energy now. We are less dependent on them than we were, and we want to focus on the rise of China and other kinds of things. Furthermore, and, you know, we haven't mentioned this in the course of this discussion for obvious reasons, there's a war going on in Ukraine yes, that threatens this. all of Europe, right? Yes. And, and, and the Russians pose a real threat to U.S. interests, to our allies' interests, um, and if we, you know, right now we are getting this kind of super bargain where we give the Ukrainians weapons and they go and fight the Russians and they've destroyed huge amounts of the Russian military capacity. But if if we don't succeed, if we stop providing them with this money, then the Russians will take that as a sign of weakness and encouragement. And we'll start seeing them threaten NATO countries where we are a treaty obligation to put U.S. boots on the ground to defend. And then you've got a war with Russia. So you've got this chance for a bargain way to remove a threat and avoid U.S. troops on the ground. And we're not paying attention to that. We've got to refocus our attention back. Now, perversely, really perversely, this MAGA-dominated right wing in the Republican Party is saying, oh, no, let's not give the money to Ukraine. Let's give the money to Israel. And this is unbelievably dangerous it is i mean it's a real scandal for 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 what it could possibly unleash um because ukraine is a conflict of strategic importance and the battle bet- over what the future of israel looks like i'm sorry to say it it just isn't as strategically important as it used to be and so is it important are the human stories important should we care about our allies absolutely but not to the exclusion of things that are more strategically important to us, like Ukraine. Yeah. And I I can't, it's exactly what I've been thinking about all the time, because we keep hearing all these stories about Biden losing a significant amount of votes and support because of this crisis. And that to me feels deliberate, because to me, I look at this crisis and I go, Iran's hands are clearly in this. Russia's hands are clearly all over this. We're talking about the genocide of Palestinians. So we're not talking about the genocide happening in Ukraine. I mean, they want to just wipe Ukraine from the map. They're destroying everything, including their libraries of Ukrainian history, right? They're taking their children. They're putting them in Russian homes. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I just want to say one thing there, because you just hit a raw nerve with me. You talked about the Hamas going into Israel and kidnapping 200 people. The Russians have kidnapped perhaps 600,000 Ukrainian children, taken them from their homes, told them they couldn't speak Ukrainian anymore, taught them Russian songs, put them in Russian families, sent them to Siberia. 600,000. If you're outraged by what happened on October 7th, please Be outraged by what's happened in Ukraine in this war, which didn't start a couple years ago. It started 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It all just feels very strategic to me. Like this is just another way for foreign bad actors to once again interfere in an American presidential election. And I can't help but feel that certain parts of the American left have been led into a huge trap that uses their goodness and their hope and their empathy against them. Because what's happening in Gaza is horrendous. Uh, But so was what was happening in Syria and Yemen and Armenia. But these same American people weren't protesting that. So it feels like what, what happened? What's the difference? Why are people out in force now? And it feels like because foreign bad actors want us to be. They want us against each other. Well, there's something super cynical, right? Because... There, you know, there, a lot of people are saying, well, the left has got a lot of anti-Semites. Well, the left doesn't have a lot of anti-Semites. It has some because they're anti-Semites everywhere. But the right wing is the party of Donald Trump, who had Hitler's speeches next to his bed, who called 
the marchers in Charlottesville who were walking down the street saying Jews will not replace us, very fine people, who has supported all of this stuff. You know, the, 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 it's the right wing that is, has actually fostered anti-Semitism that is now criticizing the left wing for the very thing that, that, that they talked about simply because they are supportive of the Palestinian people. And you made a, a vitally important distinction. Being supportive of the people of Palestine because you're a decent human being is not the same as supporting Hamas, a bunch of terrorists who you can and should revile. And, and you know, th- th- these nuances at a time of really heightened emotions have been lost. And so, you know, when you have a, a, a university president say, well, if there were a speech on our campus saying X, Y, and Z, I'd have to examine it in terms of context, which is, by the way, the right answer. You know, I mean, that's what you want a university president to do. Um, you immediately had, you know, these kind of lynch mobs go and say, no, no, fire these presidents. Because they're not yeah. giving us the emotional answer that we want uh, at this particular time, and it's deeply cynical. You know, you talk about it in the context of American politics. One of the things that the Republicans have said they're not going to do the funding for Israel or for Ukraine until they get the border solved. Well, what did what did they say this week? What did Mike Johnson say yesterday? He said, "Oh, we're not going to get that solved." They're not going to work at all. It's we're not going to get that <laughs> solved. But that's that's. Yeah. So, so the past month of the people of Ukraine in the middle of winter having North Korean and other kinds of missiles raining down on them, and they don't have the support that they need from us, is because of a cynical p- political move by the MAGA crowd. So why is it that we're hearing everything about a ceasefire? Why is, aren't we hearing that Hamas should surrender? Why are people not protesting for Hamas to surrender, give back the hostages? Because wouldn't that make the whole thing over? Why is it? Well, first of all, Hamas is not, you know, I mean, it's amorphous, right? When you say they surrender. They're not going to do it. I'm not suggesting that's 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 actually feasible or possible. That's not a realistic thing. And secondly, you know, Hamas is- But why are people protesting for that? Do you know what I mean? Well, I think there are a lot of people are protesting for that. I mean, I think there are a lot of people, I mean, you and I both, I think, want to see Hamas- destroyed, want to see Hamas replaced by a more regional, reasonable group. You want to see the hostages returned, and you want to see the people of Palestine, you know, granted the human rights that all of us are entitled to, to be cared for, to have homes, uh, to not be killed randomly by, you know, uh, you know it's the systematic destruction of their land. Uh, and not to be, you know, ethnically cleansed, shipped off to another country. So that, here's the problem. What you want is not a bumper sticker, right? What you want is, is, is a reasonable array of steps to produce the best possible outcome. And it goes very back to the very first point I made. For humans to live in a decent way on the planet. Uh, yeah. But that you know doesn't make for a pretty you know great slogan through a bullhorn, and and you know that's you know what happens in moments like this is people say I got to do something. I'm going in the street. I'm going on Twitter. I'm you know I'm going to go onto YouTube, and I'm going to give you a little soundbite. And you can't tell the story you just told in a soundbite, and you can't prescribe the outcome that the region calls for and a soundbite. And so people boil it down to one extreme or the other, the one that gets the crowd most worked up because that gets things viral. And they do that and we lose all sight of the, of the real serious problem at the core of this. So what can America do? to negate some of this tragedy because we have to do something because clearly it's our money and weapons that's doing some damage. I think the argument you were kind of making in the article is that doing nothing, which I don't think is the plan of the Biden government or the Blinken leadership of the State Department, but if we don't do anything, it's akin to rubber stamping behavior, right? Because ultimately- if, If we were disengaged, Israel wouldn't listen to us. If we are engaged, they will listen a little bit. But we can't, you know, by by extension, sort of grant them carte blanche to do whatever they want. So we've got to go in, we engage them, 
We tell them what we think are our goals. We want a peace. You've got to limit the vac- attacks on civilians. Let's have a discussion about what the day after the conflict looks like, who's going to lead the Palestinians, so forth. And and then you've got to sort of use all your leverage. And Joe Biden is more popular in Israel than Benjamin Netanyahu is right now. You've got to Good. use your you got to <laughs> use your leverage to try to persuade them to do the right thing. And they'll do it a little bit. But you've also got to make it clearer to them than we have made it clear thus far. That if they take one step in the direction of ethnic cleansing, everything stops. The United States will not support that. There have to be limits. Israel believes that they have the right to do whatever they want. And no matter what happens, the U.S. will go along with it. And the, and and Biden and, and everybody around him, I, I think, understand this and I think are trying to communicate this in a way that doesn't produce a crisis. But I think at, at, at a certain point, the Israelis have got to know, and I think some of them do know, that there are limits. Uh, and that our goal is for the end of this fighting, a new leadership, a path towards um, rebuilding, um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a political settlement. And then, by the way, when Vice President Kamala Harris, who's been actively involved in this from the very beginning, got on a plane and went to Dubai and met with regional leaders, that was her focus the day after. Security solution, economic solution, political solution. Yeah. As you point out in your article, there was clearly a time when Israel wasn't just a necessary safe haven for the world's Jewish population, but was also considered kind of a shining light in its region, this country that promoted democracy and innovation. And this nation that was, of course, of vital interest to the United States in context of the Cold War and in the Middle East and in the, you know, our interest in oil, but also a country that would join America in the goal of expanding liberal democracies and the best interests of humanities around the world. But today's Israeli government, not the Israeli people, but the government, have kind of abused that trust. And what you wrote in your article is we need to ask ourselves what America's red line is and how long does a country allow its allies to undermine its own security, its own values, and harm themselves and others? because you can't really stand by while your friend does that. We have to stop it even if it's awkward and uncomfortable and hard and a hard thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. That's sort of where we're at. I think both governments need to be replaced with moderates uh, who think beyond the complete destruction of the other uh, and their own power mongering. You mean Israeli and Palestinian? Both. Yes. Yeah, both. yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I always use, I always say friends don't let friends drive drunk. Sometimes yeah. the friendliest thing that we can do to a country is to take the keys away, oppose the stand. And, and I think that's exactly what we've got to do in this case. And I think that's what the Biden administration is trying to do in this case. And, um, you know, I, I think they can be more forceful, uh, but I'm glad they were there. Because if Donald Trump were the president of the United States, just as he would let Vladimir Putin do whatever he wanted to do in Ukraine, and by the way, when he says, I'd stand up to him, no, the war went on for all four years Donald Trump was president, and he didn't do anything to stop it. Donald Trump would have said to Bibi, have at it, buddy. What do you need? And, and And he would not have done anything to lessen the catastrophic damages associated with the Israeli response. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, you know, we, we're we're in a better place than we would be there. We need to get to a better place than we are in now. And my guess is, you know, again, at the end of this month, you're going to see a change in the Israeli strategy because the U.S. has pressured them in that direction. Uh, the broader war approach will end, more targeted approach will begin. And we'll see whether that leads to political changes that we want within this. Uh, And I think that's important for a number of reasons, not the least of which are political here in the United States. This should not be a distraction from the core issue, which is do we choose to preserve democracy in the United States or not? Yeah. And if you do look out for the people in Palestine and you are looking for a proper peaceful transition to a 
hopefully a two-state solution. What you don't want to do is put someone in power in America who would make the whole thing infinitely worse, you know, not just in the Middle East, but for Muslim people in general around the world and for the entire world Well, order. But yeah, I mean, because that's the-, the thing. You know, people are going, oh, yeah, I can't vote for Biden because he's supported Israel and that made, you know, life uh, hell for the Palestinians. So you're going to support the author of the Muslim ban who said he's going to do it again? You're going to support somebody who's opposed to brown people coming to the United States, who wants to shoot at the Mexican border, who, you know, I mean, who wants to put Stephen Miller back in charge of all this stuff? Are you kidding me? That is not, you know, a better option than the one that we've got right now. You know, the, the, you know to, just to go back to your core point, the reason the United States and Israel were aligned since Israel was founded, shared values. What has happened is that there has been a divergence in the values of the United States and the values of the extreme right in Israel, and they're less democratic, they're less respectful of human rights, et cetera, et cetera. And the message to them needs to be, our relationship is based on shared values. And when you stop sharing our values, it weakens our relationship. I mean, the far right clearly just want to be authoritarian with complete control and punishing enemies and answering to no one and having either a main religion or a main thought or a main people that belong and everyone else falls in underneath. It's Putin, it's Orban, it's Xi, honestly, it's Netanyahu. And if we don't make the right choice at home, it'll be Trump. Absolutely right. I want to thank you for joining us today, David. I know this is a horrifying and complicated topic, but it's one that really deserves our attention and our thought. And I really appreciate you having the conversation with me. Tell people how they can follow you and your work uh, moving forward. Well, first of all, thanks. And I appreciate having the time to have this discussion. Uh, Most of the the, the easiest way to find me is at the dsrnetwork.com. We do bunch of podcasts. We're about to launch a thing with the New Republic where we're doing a bunch of podcasts with them. So by next, by the end of a month from now, we'll, we'll be up to something like 17 different podcasts a week. And you can find that at the DSR Network. And I write a column every week for the Daily Beast. And I've got one on the third anniversary of January 6th. Um, and, you know, I write books and stuff like that every so often. So or I'm on MSNBC every so often. So I'm those places too. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate the invitation. So that was David Rothkop reminding us that the crisis in the Middle East, like so many issues that really matter, simply won't fit on a bumper sticker. We must explore the nuance. We have to take a look at the whole picture and move beyond who needs to be punished, and many do, to a place of peace and stability. Governments around the world are shifting to the far right and supporting each other as they do it. So whether it's Putin, Netanyahu, Hamas, or Trump, they are looking out for number one. And we need to be supporting alternatives who are looking out for everyone to succeed, not just the select few. The Palestinian people deserve a state of their own without Israeli occupation. And the Israeli people deserve the right to exist in safety in the midst of a hostile region. It's an incredibly hard needle to thread. But a peaceful coexistence is what anyone who believes in the rights of humanity should want. My heart goes out to the people of Israel and the Jewish people around the world as they watch this crisis unfold, and to the innocent Palestinians caught in the crossfire who just want to live in peace. I want to thank David for joining us today, and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. With hope for a better future, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.